afternoon. Uh, another great uh, opportunity to, uh, to hear from uh, a uh, successful business person, an entrepreneur. I'm going to just, uh, uh, those of you that don't know me, I guess the undergrads that are here, I'm Ed Riefenstahl. I'm the director of experiential learning in the MBA program, uh, which has uh, anything that uh, allows our MBAs to either show what they can do or have the opportunity to meet people at this stage of their career where they might otherwise not have that opportunity. And uh, so having our guest today falls into that, uh, into that, uh, into that bucket. I'm going to just uh, turn it over to uh, Mr. Uh, Danny Wynn, uh, president of the NBA Real Estate Club, to make, uh, make the introduction. Danny? So uh, it's with a great honor for me to introduce our guest speaker today. Um, more than anything else, this is you know, the epitome of an American dream. Uh, Mr. Yonan came to America with $25 in his hand and a, and a Bible in the other. And through hard work, dedication, determination, he rose through the rank, worked for several major company and management responsibilities, uh, companies such as GM, Johnson Control, in places all over the world, Asia, Europe, you name it. In 2002, Mr. Yonan uh, then went off and built Yonan Property. Uh, through strategic acquisition, disposition, and repositioning of his capital, he managed to take a small startup from Class C properties into Class A high-rise office buildings that is worth approximately $4 billion. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Not big enough. <laughs> uh, he also, uh, I believe, a bachelor in mechanical engineering yes. from the uh, University of Illinois. That's good serves on the board of director for the uh, Lust Center of Real Estate over at USC. Um, the board of the, uh, I believe, the Smithsonian Frontier Air Museum over in Dallas, as well as the uh, Christian Oak uh, Academy over in California. The best thing about it is, despite all this, he still makes time to answer my emails and phone calls. <laughs> and a simple guy like me, so you don't find too many successful people who are as humble as he is. So. Please welcome me and uh, join me in welcoming Mr. Young. Thank you. There is a reason why I answer your email and everybody else's email immediately. It's because in the old days, we used to get our inspiration and direction from the older people, from the people that were 70, 75, 80 years old, chairman of the major companies, because we thought through that process we're going to learn something from them, right? So when I was younger, every time I saw older guys, I always went sat next to them, right? Because I thought I'm going to learn something that I can, I can be way ahead of my friends and colleagues. But today, because of the revolutions we have in technology and the industry, I get my inspiration from the young people like you guys. I'd much rather sit here and talk to you than the chairman of GM or everybody else because. What am I going to learn from Chairman of GM, Chairman of AT&T, Chairman of Johnson Control? Nothing. But I would, what I could learn from you, from your enthusiasm, and from your vision, is how the world landscape is going to be in the future, and what I need to do now to adjust myself to fit within that landscape in the future. In the past, most of the products were developed by average age of the inventor, around 50. In the last 10 years, most of the products are developed by the average inventor in age of 25. Age of 25. The young guys are the one that revolutionize this industry. The young guys are the one that are able to connect us. But I can pick up my cell phone, make a call to China. Instantly, talking to a guy in China, he could hear me instantly, and I could hear him instantly back. Do we ever wonder how is that possible? How does my voice go all the way from here to China in a speed 100 times faster than the speed of a light? How is that possible? Have you guys ever thought about it? Isn't that interesting? We'll talk a little bit about that. I apologize. I have a terrible cold. I know my voice is a little bit sexy, but <laughs> <laughs> I feel terrible, you know? But I wouldn't give this for anything because I do this often and people always ask me, uh, I was at the LA uh, Biz last week at LA Vibes, speaking to about thousands of people. And 
the type of question I get from adults, your fathers and your uncles and your grandfathers, sometimes bore me to death. But the question I get from you guys, from you guys, keep me up at night. Keep me up at night thinking how I should navigate my business, my life going forward. Young people like you are going to shape our world. You have been shaping our world. Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs at early age, Bill Gates, they were all within your age where you decided suddenly they're gonna do something that revolutionized the way we live because they start daring to be different. Steve Jobs once said, all his life as he was growing up, his father was a plumber. Everybody told him, the world is the way it is. So just find a way of living in it. And he had a problem with that concept. He says, I kind of don't agree with that, that the world is the way it is, and I should find a way of living in it. I'm going to do something. I'm going to change this world the way I'd like to see it change. See, everything around us, the chairs, the tables, the aircraft, the cars, the bicycles, the food we eat, the laptop, the cell phone, everything is created by people no smaller than you. Everything is created by people, no smaller than you. I met the young guy today here, he's sitting there, then he's got his bachelor degree at the age of 16. Right here. <laughs> at age of 16, right. These are the guys that lead through the process and procedures to be successful. These are the guys that are changing our lives. Today, even in my industry, commercial real estate industry, which historically has been all traditional industry, you can't get into it until you have a very rich father, which I didn't have, until you have a big trust account, which obviously I didn't have, unless you know everybody in the city, which I didn't know. But today, this industry, which is a $4 trillion industry, is the largest industry in our country. Out of the 17 and a half million trillion dollars total GDP we have in this country, four trillion of it, four trillion of it is commercial real estate. That falls in five segments. Commercial real estate is bigger than defense. It's bigger than any other industry. And I see that industry today being shaped by young people. By young people with no money, not knowing anybody, but what set them apart was separating from everybody else, they think different. They're smart enough to think different. Not only they dare to think different, they try to bring the innovative component into the industry. I've seen them get in, I've seen them get very wealthy, and I've seen them to be very successful. It is always important for all of us to dare to be different not to follow the path that everybody else has followed. It reminds me when you go to the butcher stuff, all the cows following each other, not knowing 20 feet in front, they are gonna get butchered. Just imagine one of those cows says, I'm not gonna follow these guys. I'm gonna go to a different route, right? He's gonna stay alive. I dare to be different. When I was 12 years old, living in Iran, my father was a truck driver, my mother was a housewife, both didn't have education past the second grade. Thought that, I don't like this environment. I don't want to live here. So I went in at the age of 12, started working, getting enough money to go buy my ticket to come to the United States, go get my passport, go get my visa, figure out where I'm going to live in the United States, figure out how I'm going to get to the airport because we had no cars. Matter of fact, my own mother, believe it or not, did not know I was coming to America to the night before my flight when I was packing my clothes. And she says, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to America. She says, how, where, what is your ticket? I said, right here. <laughs> where is your passport? Right here. <laughs> what is your visa? Here. Where are you going to live down there? Here. How are you going to get to the airport? Here. My neighbor's going to take me there. <laughs> she just did it now. I was so desperate to come to this country at age of 12. What do you do in this Iran? Is it 
very Islamic country and I happen to be a Christian, you know, you can't get a job and everything. At that age, back in the 70s, I invented mobile garage sale. You know, a garage sale works here. Everybody put their junk in front of the garage, hoping someone will buy it. Well, we didn't have a garage because we didn't have a car. So I figured I'm going to take my junk and take it door to door, knock on the door, see if anybody wants to buy my junk. <laughs> it was a great dynamic process. Besides, instead of waiting for a customer to come to you, you could be sitting in a sunny day, getting a heat stroke, waiting for people to stop by. I actually went to their door, knocking on their door. They saw a little guy with a little bit light color hair, which is odd in Iran. They felt they got to buy something from me. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then I was able to come to this country at a very early age. I knew education was very important for me. Very important. Without education, you have no identity. Without education in this era, without truly getting a degree, truly, you are nobody. If you talk to Mark Zuckerberg, if you talk to Bill Gates, if you talk to Steve Jobs, poor guy is dead now, now. But if you read his book, they always felt sorry that they didn't finish their degree. They felt something was missing. They felt part of their identity was missing. So I'm in school, I get my high school, get my bachelor degree at age of 19, not 16, which I feel really bad right now. You're gonna keep me up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a job and I start working. See, a lot of people think opportunity is something that other people have to create for us. How often you heard from your mom, from your dad, from your neighbor, from your uncle, from the faculties, that, oh, there is no opportunity for me to advance here. There is no opportunity for me to get bigger raise. Hey, there is no opportunity for me to play football. There is no opportunity for me to get ahead of life. There is no opportunity for me to be successful in this city. How often have you guys heard that? Often, haven't you? Often, haven't you? But that's the excuse. Let me tell you why I see opportunity. Let me tell you what my definition of opportunity is. When I was a young kid, I was working, I was working very hard. When I was 13, when I came to this country, I was working for McDonald's. When I was 14, I was a busboy washing dishes in the middle of the night. When I was 15, while I was going to my last few years of high school, I was working in a factory. Right after school, I used to run, take my bicycle, go to factory, put a to probably working to 11 o'clock, come home, do my home, eat something, and sleep. See, I never thought I was better than any of those jobs I did. Mopping floor, washing dishes, which is pretty disgusting. Imagine everybody's, which you find out everybody ate, right? <laughs> Take your mouth, wash dishes. I never thought that I was better than any of those jobs. I thank God for the blessing to have a job, no matter what it was, back then, Minimum wage was three dollars fifty cents. If I'm getting three fifty, if I'm working all day, all month, and my paycheck after taxes come up to ninety-seven bucks, I was happy. And every time I change a job, I worked so hard to make sure I would never quit my job until I had a better job. Through my hard work, I create opportunity for myself. I didn't look for other people to create opportunity for me. I didn't go out and ask other people to create something for me that I'd be successful. I did it myself. Those are the best opportunities, the opportunities that we create for ourselves. And while I had a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, crying out he didn't have an opportunity to take over this division in Asia, take over this division in Germany or Europe, I was running circle around him, doing my job, working hard, and those opportunities always used to come to me. Create your own opportunities. Even while you're attending the school, this is a significant opportunity. You are so blessed that you come to this beautiful university, beautiful facilities, beautiful faculty members. I mean, you know, your faculties had to go to a distance to get me come here to talk to you guys. Why? Because they care about you guys. Why? Because they know you live in this academic life. Pretty soon you're gonna make a jump to this practical life. 
and they know there is this bridge that you need to cross, and they want to make sure you cross it effectively. Take advantage of this opportunity. We all have desire, right? We have desire to be rich. We have desire to have nice houses, nice cars. Some of us desire to get a straight A. What if, if our desire doesn't inspire us? If we are people without inspiration, how are we going to achieve that? I could have all the desire in the world to have a straight A. If I don't study, if I don't work hard, if I'm not inspired to do that, how is it possible that I could get a better grade? Every one of us in this room has a desire. Some of us have a desire to have a house. Some have a desire to have a latest laptop. Some of us have a desire to have this, to have that. There isn't a person in this room without a desire. But how many people in this room are inspired, are inspired by that desire to find a way to make that happen, to make what they need happen? The greatest things in the world were invented when people were inspired. The best paintings in the world done when people were inspired. The best product in the world were developed where people were inspired. Michael Zuckerberg developed Facebook, which almost every one of you use except me, because my wife does not allow me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what inspired my Mark to develop Facebook? He was going out with this girl that he liked a lot. I'm sure you've seen this movie or read his book, right? And the girl wouldn't give him a time of the day. So he thought he's going to make his, this girl jealous by putting some picture of other girls, telling Mark how much they like it. <laughs> Those girls put their picture up there, then other guys put theirs, then other girls put theirs. Suddenly overnight, he had 2,500 people getting on that book, telling each other how much they like Mark. <laughs> suddenly became a product. Mark Zuckerberg is one of the wealthy, is the wealthiest young man on the earth. Seven billion dollars net worth. People use his product more than anything else on the world. People use Facebook a day more than people drink Coca-Cola, 7-Up, and Diet Pepsi, all collectively together. That is huge. What got him there was an inspiration. So make sure you drive the energy that you have for your desire and create an inspiration that you can execute. You can execute on the things you want to achieve in life. I was inspired. I was inspired when I was a kid. That's the first thing I wanted when I was age of seven. I had a Rolex watch. I always wanted to have a Rolex watch. I always wanted to have a nice car. I always wanted to have a nice houses. I figured the only way I could get that is through my own effort, to my own desire, to my own inspiration. And when I graduated from university, I started working for General Motors. When I worked for General Motors, because I was inspired, while everybody were going home at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I was the only guy, and back then we didn't have offices, we didn't have cubicle, we were sitting on one table. So there's a huge room with 1,000 engineers sitting on one table. And there was no computer. There was only one computer in the middle of the floor for all those people to use. And they have to register the name for the time they want to use it so everybody had access to that computer because the computers were on the laptop. They were connected to the mainframe. And, you know, mainframe couldn't process multiple input and on and on and on. We had to use it. So while these guys were going home at 4 o'clock, because 4 o'clock was the time to go home, I said, you know what? I'm going to sit here. If I drive home, I'm going to hit the traffic. I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to work. At age of 20, I was one of the early inventors I the final element analysis, three-dimensional mathematical modeling that you can take any physical component, mathematically model it, and through mathematical changes to it, like heat, cold, you can see what the effect is. 
Because back then, if they want to build the engine to see if the engine is going to perform a certain type of RPM, it takes him years to build it. I develop a way that you can program it in a very fast period of time and stimulate that through a software and a computer. I was very hard at it. Really, my main interest wasn't to develop that. I mean, I'm not one of those geeky guys that really software developer never was. But I wanted to be successful. I wanted to get ahead of life. And I was willing to work hard. I was willing to put the hours. Now, we talk about fun a little bit later. I get to that, right? <laughs> because you all say, but it's four years university. We got to have all the fun we need to have. If we spend so much time studying, when are we going to have the fun? I'll get to it the last one. I'll bring all this to a nice conclusion for you guys, right? At age of 23, we develop airbag components. I was the first inventor of variable temperature seat, the seats that she's in your car that heats and cools. First inventor of radio frequency keyless entry system, where you can basically open your door keylessly. And the more I start developing, the more I start being noticed, the more I start getting promoted in corporate life. At age of 27, I was a president of the Oldsmobile Division. To this day, the youngest president after me has been 52. I let my desire to inspire me, and I let that inspiration to go on. I was willing to work hard. Initially, I didn't like it, but when I started doing it, I started really liking it because I was seeing the resolve. At age of 30, we developed the first navigation system. Age of 32, first voice interactive navigation system, the one that you talk to to your voice. And that's the complex algorithm, because each voice is different, different accent, different dialect, you know, different pitch. You have to develop a technology that can do a lot of correlation and analysis to be able to understand your voice. Age of 28, we developed the equation, differential equation, to develop super colliders for the dome over North America that to this day, the North Command Center in Colorado use it to protect America if any missile comes to North America. Funny thing is, funny thing is that I done all of that and I graduated age of 19, I barely passed high school. Matter of fact, on the day of my graduation from high school, I didn't go to graduation. My father was there, my mother was there, my sisters were there, I didn't go. And the reason I didn't go, because I thought I didn't graduate, and I thought my father's gonna beat the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I'm not gonna go. And then a day later, when I found out I graduated, I was shocked. <laughs> what change I apply myself? What change I developed that desire and inspiration? which is more powerful than anything. It can overcome any handicap, right? Steve Jobs didn't finish university. Michael Dell has an attention deficit problem. Steve Jobs has it. Bill Palmer has it. But none of these guys let those things stop them. They said, okay, I know what I don't have. I'm gonna discover what I have, and I'm gonna utilize that the best I can. And let me tell you something. Going back to those years, I am so glad at university, I took my studies seriously. I had fun, I went out once in a while, not a lot, enough. But I'm so glad I did what I did. Because my life has changed significantly. And I think about it often, and I wouldn't want to change anything. When I built this company, Yonan Properties, everybody told me this industry. They said, oh, you can't get into this industry. I said, how's that? They won't sell your building. I said, are you telling me if somebody sells me a building for $50 million, I can buy it? They won't sell it to me? Absolutely not. Because remember, you're not the only buyer. There's other buyers. And you're the new guy. You speak with funny accent, Texas. <laughs> if you don't like that, you know? <laughs> You don't like that. So you're not going to be able to be successful. So I went in. I started buying a low-profile, smaller building. 
building that no one wants to buy. <laughs> Within three years, I became the largest landlord in entire North Texas. 12 million square feet, two and a half billion dollars of acquisition. Every large building in Dallas, I owned it. I was fatuated with tall building. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Seriously. So everyone. Hard work. Create my own opportunity. Let my desire to inspire me. And find a way in this beautiful country that anything and everything is achievable. God has truly blessed the United States of America. Any one of us can be anything we want to be. At any time, all we have to do is put that effort to a trying to get there. Having fun is the important part of the equation. We talked about desire. Desire that inspires us, inspire that makes us work hard to achieve what we want to achieve. Now, if you have all the cars in the world, all the homes that you ever want, you will have no more desire, would you? Because you got everything, right? What's your desire? You have the yacht, you have the plane, you have everything. What would you desire? That's what happens to some people, they go crazy. They go crazy because God blessed them. They go crazy because they have everything in the world. There is a rich girl in Los Angeles bought a $150 million house. My father is an inventor of Formula One. She got fight with her husband, was all in the news. She burned part of a $150 million house on because she was to sell. That person is doomed. It's gone. Rockefeller, at age of 58, was diagnosed with this rare disease that they told him he's going to die in 12 months. And Rockefeller was the first billionaire on earth. And Rockefeller, up to that age, had given zero, zero to anybody, to any institution, to any causes, zero. Matter of fact, if you were guests at Rockefeller House and you want to make a phone call, he had a public paid one at his house <laughs> that he used to tell you, go put your dime in there and make a call. Don't use the house phone. Goes to a doctor, doctor says you're gonna die in a year. He was a miserable man. A church charity comes to him, they wanted $3,000 to build a classroom for the young kids. First, he says, I'm not going to give it. Somehow, his wife told him, do it. Do it. If you don't do it, I'll do it. So he did it. A couple months later, he felt good a little bit about himself. He helped someone. He started being happy. <coughs> he started doing a little bit more. He started doing a little bit more. A little bit more. Rockefeller lived 18 years after that. And by the time he died, he had given 80% of his wealth away. When we are satisfied with what we have, right? Sometimes we're selfish. We say, I got everything I want. You know, I want my desire to go away. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go get myself happy, make someone else's dream come true. By making someone else's dream come true, now I'm busy working on this dream. Now I'm again inspired and desire. Now I'm again happy. Now I have a goal to wake up early in the morning. I have something to achieve. Not for me, for someone else. But it comes hard to give. And when you give, you feel charged to have more desire, more inspiration, to create more opportunity, to continue to do your hard work going forward. See, this world is not about us living our dream. 
is about living the dream. That includes your family member, your friends, your neighbor, faculties, priests, people that you dealt with that somebody influenced you. And we do that often for our own selfish reason, to make ourselves feel good. But it's a win-win because we make everybody feel good. So always remember, any opportunity that you feel you don't have, create it on your own. Take your desire, which every one of you have, transform it to inspiration, and make sure you're always inspired. Never be bored. You all, good-looking, healthy, young kids, you get the world in front of you. Be happy. Don't be sad. Be happy for what you have, and don't think about what you don't have. Be happy about what you could have. And always remember, anything and everything that you want in this life, I have seen it for myself time after time. No matter how unachievable those goals are, become achievable when you increase <coughs> your intensity toward working hard. I'm sick, I didn't feel good, but I come here. They asked Apollius, one of the great Roman emperor, in the middle of the war with Greece. He had an arrow on his leg and an arrow on his eyes. They said, please sit here, relax. We continue to fight the rest of the fight for you. He said, I still have another eye. So let me stop, keep, let me continue to fight until the other guy is gone, then I'll sit down. Strength of the human that can carry himself, no matter how much pain or agony they have. My last semester at university, I got kicked out because my scholarship stopped, because they found out that I was a US citizen, which I wasn't. And uh, uh, my father didn't have any money to give me. So my last semester, which I was taking 22 hours, my last semester of engineering, so I'm taking all the hard classes. I was homeless in Chicago. I was living in presidential library, presidential libraries like this, where you can go study, open 24-7. But when the faculty and security see you sleeping there, right? He knows that you're not studying, you're sleeping there. He says, hey, I have a place to sleep. Either study or go away. I used to study in our, I used to sleep in our gym. They found out. They let me out. I used to sleep in the library because we had a huge library. Back then, second biggest library after Congress Library. And those security guards would not search every square feet of that library, right? <laughs> so I used to sleep there, and there was no heater, naturally. There was shupas, shupas, those heat exchangers outside, those metal heat exchangers. So after everybody leave, I would go wash my clothes in the library bathroom. I would put them on the shupas, because I know right after they turn them off, they're still going to be hot for two hours. So my clothes dry up. I used to sleep there. And I graduated, and I graduated fine. When I graduated, my father came in to pick me up. I had to take him to 30 places, look for the garbage bag where my clothes were in. And he said, what is your clothes doing here? And I said, well, Dad, thanks to you, you didn't send me $500. They took me out of the Lincoln Hall. So I had to kind of sleep here there, you know? So human is very strong. The tougher it gets, don't quit. Work harder. The tougher it gets, don't reduce your intensity, increase it. Look at these football games. You all watch football games, right? When they fall behind, no matter how painful it is to play good football, they get hit, they get hit hard, they break arms and legs, but they don't care. They continue to play hard. Matter of fact, the quarterback who just threw the ball and is being sacked by this 350 pounds guy on his way down, he's looking at the ball, want to make sure that ball is caught. What a brave young kid. Funny, we look at it, but we don't learn any life lessons from them. We pay more attention on a butt like advertising commercial. <laughs> but not that poor quarterback who just got hit with 350 pounds guy. On his way down, he's looking at the ball, and if the ball is caught, he does this. And if the ball is not caught, he touches the helmet, feels the pain of not achieving his goal. How often during the day 
when we don't turn our homework, when we don't get the grade we need to get, we grab our face and feel that agony like, my God, drop the ball this time, shouldn't happen the next time. What's the purpose of us watching football and everything else if you are not going to learn anything from them? Now, I, at age of 52, father of five, that was my take on football. I see a guy limping, but he's still getting the line. I see a guy falling, five, six guys, at the weight, two, three thousand pounds, pound on top of him. He gets up, he doesn't explain. Because he's focused to be successful. He's focused to win. Winning is important for him. And he or she are willing to go through the pain to achieve that winning. You all could be winner. The world out there is yours to catch. Be the change you want to see in the world today. That change will happen. I speak to a lot of students, and I told you, I really enjoy speaking to them because they always ask the offline question, tough questions, and stuff like that, and it makes me feel good. But I get also inspired from your intensity and your wisdom, and the fact that today, the average inventor is age of 25. They're predicting in the next 20 years, the average inventor in this country would be age of 20. People at age of 20 will be inventing product and processes. But I cannot stress the importance. You are blessed by being in this great institution. You are blessed to have a family that supports you to be in this institution, unless you have a father like mine. You are blessed by faculties that they don't just try to do their job, they really care for you to be successful. The rest is your effort. Have fun. Enjoy life. Don't do too much of it. Don't waste your time watching TV. Don't waste your time watching what Kim Kardashian is wearing. Who cares who she's wearing? <laughs> this woman is making more money than all of us by doing nothing. <laughs> Don't give her more business. Don't play games. You guys are too old to be playing Nintendo's or whatever that shit is. <laughs> <laughs> Don't play that shit. They're too old for that. Man. You guys are too too mind for that shit. That's for kids for 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old. You know what I mean? Have fun. Balance your life. Have a little bit of it. And I will promise you, each and every one of you will achieve all your dreams, but you will have a happy life. Your family will have a happy life. And you will touch many lives. Many lives. That when the time comes for you to reflect on your life, you will smile and you will say, I am so happy of the life I live. That's exactly what Steve Jobs said, his last word before he died. Okay? Any question? It seems like a, a major aspect of, of your formula for success and what you've implemented in your own life is revolved around self-discipline um, that goes along with your work ethic. What, what general advice would you give to us students of developing our own self-discipline, cutting out the idle distractions like video Good games? question, very good question. Let me answer the second part that I get. That's a very good question you asked. Very good question you asked because something I should have talked about. Let me tell you a story. When I was 27 years old, I was a vice president of program management uh, at TRW. I had about $1 billion responsibility to ship automotive components to all the car makers in the program. And at the age of 27, I remember talking about this event. I remember it was a Christmas party. Everybody went to, to, to the hotel. The place was completely shut down. The place was completely shut down, right? So factory was working hard, right? So I said, you know, I'm not going to go. I'm going to work here. And later on, I'm going to go say hello to everybody. I'm just going to go home, right? So I'm working. You know, it's hard discipline. Quiet. Everybody's out. You're working hard, right? Suddenly, you get a call from a BMW. BMW vehicles were driving in Germany, and the airbag was deployed. Imagine you're driving your car in the street. Suddenly, the airbag deployed. Brother, when airbag deploys, makes a huge noise. 
And if you're not in an accident, you will get an accident when that thing deploys because it makes a huge noise. It has a lot of power. You use the power. You put the power in there so it doesn't stick on each other over the years. And also, it doesn't deflate. Only time deflate in the event of the crash is your body deacceleration toward the back deflating. So these people are driving the regular seat, young guys, old guys, old ladies, suddenly the back deploys. They can't see in front of them. Smoke everywhere. They get a massive accident, right? So BMW was scared to shut the shit. Said, oh my God, what's going to happen here? We're going to talk about liability, right? And BMW wasn't my company. I always wanted a BMW to come. And every time I make the pitch for it, the president of the company said, are you too young? Just relax. You already have Asia. You want the Europe. You want the world. Relax. You know, 20 years, 25 years, we'll give you the Europe. I said, 20, 25 years? I'll be 55 years old. I want to have the Europe now. So the program director for BMW was in a party. What normally somebody will do is pick up the phone, call them, say, hey, get back here. You have a major problem. You need to figure out what's going on, and you need to answer to BMW. I did it. I said, I can solve this problem. So I called the people from production, which were downstairs in the factory, get some data, analyze it, make the story short, find out that we were uh, 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 setting them too sensitive. We set those sensors too sensitive that if the car goes over a bump, the vehicle thinks it's an accident, the airbags are blown. Had it all figured it out, back then you didn't have email, so I'm writing a fax, because you have to send a fax to Germany that, hey, I figure out what the problem is. I figure out which serial numbers are affected by the problem. All you have to do is go to those serial numbers, to those cars, take those cars off, and here's a procedure how you calibrate it. Like, had it all figured out, right? 7 p.m., everybody came back. They find out there's a problem. Everybody came back. The president of the entire company came in and says, whoa, what happened? And they said, oh, Zaya is handling it. He said, oh, Zaya, why don't you call us? I said, well, I couldn't call you because you guys were busy, plus I didn't have a phone, and it was middle of the factory. But don't worry, I figured it out. This is how I solved it. This is how I take care of it. Germany's happy, BMW is happy, everything's taken care of. The next day, I had the worldwide account. And the head of that division started reporting to me. It is really important to have a discipline of the hard work. I don't know if God, the Lord, has written it someplace that I'm going to make everybody equal. I'm going to give everybody equal opportunity. Let the one with the harder work get whatever he wants. Because it always happens. So I always apply to everything I do. Before I sleep, I make sure I answer all my email. I will not sleep if there is an email. I will not sleep if there is a problem. If I'm eating lunch, I make sure I'm doing my business. Up to recently, I haven't had a vacation for years. Because during the recession, we got hit hard. And we lost close to $3 billion worth of assets. I would work countless hours. When I used to work for other people, there were days I wouldn't go home. I would put all my their company. There were days that I would work. I would not have breakfast, lunch, or dinner. It wasn't important. I was laser focused on what I want. And I had to achieve that. So you got to develop that discipline. you got to go to your desire. If you truly have a desire for something, you got to make yourself believe that without discipline and hard work, you're never going to make it. For a person like me who comes to this country, uh, still not speaking proper English, and achieving what I've achieved, I contributed, I thank Lord for it, number one. And second, I contributed to focused dedication and hard work. Even at school, even at school, when I was at university, if I if they used to assign a project, I used to do that project that night. And my buddies used to say, let's go out. Said, Another month, we'll do it later. I said, John, you gotta get down anyway. Let me just get it done now, get it out of the way, so I can enjoy myself without thinking about it. That is really important work ethic that I think people have to develop. Nobody made it easy in this world. Everybody made it to the hard work. Everybody will pay about that. And you also have to do it. Did that answer your question? Yes. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the strategies that you use when you 
you were first starting your own property, mm. uh, how you were able to so quickly acquire those, what, two and a half million square feet? Did you uh, uh, leverage up, uh, what type of leverage? Leverage, the word was leverage. Many of you are MBA students, and you learn a lot of matrix of the finance, which is very important, right? What, what it takes? Why did the stock market go up today? What happened? How many of you know what happened today in Europe? They kind of did like a quantitative easing type thing with the bond buybacks, so they're pumping money into the economy. Mm -hmm. And why did they do it now, not six years ago when the economy wanted it? I don't know. <laughs> By the way, a lot of people, 99, 9.99% of the people wouldn't know that because of very complex things. What happened today, one of the reasons stock reversed back up, and because Europe, United States, when we had the recession, and I'm gonna ask you a question in a second. When the United States had the recession, they were smart enough, they said, hey, this is a big, tough recession. We're not gonna be able to overcome this recession. Let's put, let's increase the flow of the money to the market. Means, let's print more money and circulate it into a market. By printing more money, circulating it into the market, the interest rate drops. When interest rate drops, because now banks can get overnight lending from government at zero interest rate, they can easily give it to people. Activity picks up. It's like a guy who has a heart attack, they will give him an electrical shock to bring him back to life. Europe didn't do it. Europe didn't do it. The reason Europe didn't do it because, like always, Europe always do things European way, and 99% <laughs> of the time they're wrong, you know, or they're six years behind the schedule. Because Europe said, this is a good opportunity for us. We let America do it, improve their economy. That's going to overflow to ours. Dollar's going to drop. Euro's going to go up. And our currency would be a preferred currency in the world. Because right now, for most of you that don't know, America, dollar, it is a preference currency in the world. You know what that means? It means if you trade gold, and even in the world, I'm not talking about buying gold. I'm talking about 10 tons of pure gold. If you transact oil or gas, anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, it's got to transact on dollar. Did you guys do that? Has to transact on dollar. You know why? Because dollar is the most stable currency. And they don't want to sell $4 billion worth of oil, that they got $4 billion for it. And then tomorrow the value of the dollar drops, then they get less what they thought they would. Right? And that's what happened today, right? And that's what's gonna do, it's gonna excite their economy in Europe. It's gonna devalue their euro, which it did today. So next year when you guys take a vacation, go to Europe, mm -hmm. it'll be cheap, you know? It's gonna be cheap. Mm -hmm. And what happens here, increase the flow of the money into the market. Leverage, leverage, a beautiful name. A beautiful thing in the world. When I started this company, I started with $800,000. And within four years, we have done $5 billion transaction because we use leverage. We saw lenders that were willing to lend. They were hungry to lend. Money was cheap, and we took advantage of it. We were taking down $300 million building with $5 million. We were using leverage. Because the yield we were getting from investment the capital, the yield. The yield you were getting for investment was above the cost of the money. So the more you leverage, your yield is inflated significantly. You get a better yield. Because you pay 3.5% interest rate, you get a 5% yield. But you get a yield on the total money that you have and you borrow from it. So imagine, you borrow $300 million you got 150 basis point, one and a half percent. 150 basis point, arbitrage on. So imagine 150 basis point, one and a half percent, over 100 million dollars, do the math. You use their money to continue to leverage, build the leverage, and buy. So we use leverage, we use a significant. And leverage, as people say, is dangerous. It's not dangerous if the leverage falls below the equilibrium of your financials. So if you have a financial projection that your building is cash flowing, you know what the cash flow is? As long as you can satisfy the debt, as long as you know there's enough security to satisfy the debt, you feel comfortable to leverage it. 
And I think maybe now is the time, because economy is still recovering, trying to find its footing. Now is still a time for people to take advantage of this leverage, because I think it's going to be around for some time, and people can use it to grow and grow very fast. To grow very fast and build a successful company. But without using the leverage you can. Let me give you a statistical number for those MBAs who probably took a course in this. If you build a company at a certain speed, with a certain objective, if you build one company on 65% leverage, LTV, and you build another company at 85% leverage, LTV, that's a 20% difference. It will make eight times faster for you to get your cumulative return. Just that 20%. So do the math. So you have to be sophisticated. That's why my recommendation was you take a job at the bank, because you learn all those things. You get to be sophisticated enough to take advantage of the monetary condition. Leverage happens to be one of them. You can take, you can hedge against your loan. You can go get a variable loan, hedge against it, take the money of hedging off from, use it to buy another building. You can hedge your swap, hedge your interest rate. Learn those things. Because those things, if you do it right and you do it calculated, could have a significant impact on your growth. So you got to be financial savvy if you want to be really successful in this industry. Any questions? So what was it that you did starting off, you know, being a new player in the market? What are some of the strategies you would give to people who are starting off to get those negotiations and to really steal, you know, competitions that's out there and to give them a reason for you versus other people? You know, commercial real estate industry is the second oldest industry on the earth. Did you guys know that? Second oldest industry on the earth. I don't tell you what the first one is. You don't need to know that. <laughs> second oldest industry in the world. And you know it was invented by Roman. <coughs> it was invented by Roman. And you know why they invented it? Because back then, the average lifespan of Caesar was four years. Anybody who became a Caesar, somebody killed. <laughs> Anybody who became a Caesar, somebody killed. So one of the Caesars said, hey, I don't want to die. And he was a smart guy. He says, how much land do we have? He says, well, we got plenty of land. We keep conquering other countries. This is great. What do we take Roman? We give him a land. We tell that Roman he has to build property on it at his own cost. And he pays us something every month. And if anything ever happens to me, the loan matures, he loses that. So he started giving land away to people. And people start building bakery, restaurants, whatever. And start giving the Caesar monthly income. That was close to 5,000 years, 3,000 years before birth of the Christ. It's an old industry. And as old as it is, the people in it, they're all older kind of guys, rich guys from trust funds, you know, you know, grandfather, father, mother, and all that. They never picked up the essence of the finance, essence of operation of these businesses. Give you a good example. When we used to build cars, the average car, average car has 80,000 components. That means 80,000 pieces have to go together. Either bolted, welded, screwed, clipped, tilted, some of it. 80,000 parts to build a car. Imagine that. An assembly line can spit a car every minute. Every minute. So when you used to go to the plant, you used to cut the plant manager and say, what is the efficiency of your transmission assembly? He knew everything. He knew what all the component what it was. This guy was walking knowledge in the plan. In this business, when you buy a building, what do you do? You don't manage it yourself. You hire some third party to manage it. You hire some guy or some gal to manage the building. What is managing a building? Collecting the rent, paying the bills, right? 
But it's more than that. How do you want that plan? These buildings have a plan. We wouldn't want to insert it bigger than this building. Just a plant. Just a plant. The chillers, the PFDs, the cooling towers, the elevator, huge rooms. These people never understand it because they are engineers in the building. But guess what? As many engineers we have, not a single one of them have a degree. They were mechanics. They were repair guys we call them engineers in this industry. So I said to myself, wow, $4 trillion industry, biggest industry in our economy, and is managed and run so loosely, how could that be? I said, how about if I buy this building and I put people in it that truly understand how to manage it, truly understand how to run it? A couple months ago, I was looking at the building in Chicago, right? And I'm at the top of the building, I'm looking at the plant. And usually by looking at the plant, I can tell you what the size of the plant is just by looking at it, right? And I'm getting older, my eyes are all messed up, I have my glasses on, so I couldn't look at it. So I looked at the property manager, who she claims been managing that building for 20 years. She's been in that building. I said to Trisha, what's the size of that plant? Oh, she said, it's 6,000 ton. I said, what? She said, 6,000 ton. 6,000 ton is enough to cool the entire city of Chicago. <laughs> she didn't know. So our difference was trying to understand your building. Put a real engineer to manage it. Put a property manager that knows how to turn on this beast. These buildings are beasts. These buildings are huge beasts. It's a city. Imagine, one and a half million square feet. It's huge. It's huge. I don't know what the campus total square footage is, but if you put them all together, you might not even get to the height of some of these. So what separated us, I make sure we put people in charge that truly understand the property. We put people in charge that don't let the building to tell them where they should be turned on or turned off. We manage that. That's why our building today run 20% more efficient than any other building in this country. 20% more efficient. And remember, in this business, your biggest operating cost is expenses, electricity. 20% improvement efficiency goes straight to the bottom line and on. And when you want to sell that building, what's the multiple? Who knows what the multiple of NOI is to sell a building? Average? About 15 times. So every dollar you say, 15 times, if you divide it by one semi cap rate, right? Cap rate is inverse of multiples. And cap rate is your yield, right? It's a huge discount. So what happened, we were buying a building for $50 million, going in and doing some basic modern stuff. Six months later, selling it for $80 million. Now remember, the $50 million we bought, we only put $5 million in because we leveraged it. So that $5 million, six months later, became $35 million. And we took that $35 million, we then we bought a $600 million. Did the same thing, and we bought a billion dollars worth of building. We keep scaling it up, scaling it up, scaling it up. Now, recession came and slapped the shit out of us. <laughs> <laughs> we learned from it, and we're back up on our feet again. We lost a lot of money. I told my wife not to buy any purses for a few times, for a few months, <laughs> and then we're back at it again. So, uh, by managing your business very carefully and very intriguing, and you will learn that because you're getting in this industry now, and it's a good question to ask, in, and if you follow these basic rules, you will get ahead of any of your competitive people in your industry really fast. This is not an industry like a cell phone, or iPhone, or computer. Those are really technical. I really hard to get in, I really hard to excel because everything is so thought through, right? Every bits and chips and software and memory, it's really a lot of technology goes into it. Not much technology goes into it. It is a very lucrative business if you know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing, you could be very successful. And if you don't know what you're doing, you could be busted really fast. So you have to be very careful. Okay? Any other question? Yeah. Say you hire a new intern for your properties on day one without really any work experience. Uh, what, I guess, what advice would you give him in terms, him or her, in terms of you know, establishing themselves either in your company or in a different company? Mm. 
what we have, we have, you know, my, my oldest son, David, now that he just graduated from LNU. So um, um, he got a job as, a, as an associate. And what we do in our company, we have a very good inter program because inter program is very powerful. I used to be at inter program and I was going for engineering school. And we put him on rotational program. So we put David in, in every aspect of this business. When I say every aspect, I mean it like his first job is in human resources has nothing much to do with real estate, but human element is the most important part of any business. So he's got to learn that. You have good people, any business you can make it. So what we do, we put him in a rotational program. He's going to spend a period of time in human resources. He's going to spend a period of time in accounting, a period of time in engineering, period of time in property management, period of time in asset management, period of time in leasing. And then, the most important, period of time in underwriting. And then, period of time in acquisition, period of time in disposition, and now he's versatile real estate executive guy because he knows every aspect of the business. So when you take an internship, internship job, make sure they don't put you copy papers and, and go make cold calls and stuff like that. You gotta do that anyway, so do it. But say, hey, you want me to do cold call? Fine, I'm gonna do cold call. But I'm gonna do six, seven hours cold call. I'm gonna spend a couple hours running a mechanic of this business rather than just be your go boy or boy. just get you lunch and do the cold call and stuff like that. So make sure they focus you on an important thing. So you do your learning early on. That answer your question? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Well, it was a pleasure talking to you all. Thank you so much. Um, I hope, uh, uh, did you get anything out of this? Absolutely. Like what? What was the most significant point you got out of this? Creating your own opportunity I like the most. Oh, yeah, I mean, I have my brother-in-law comes to me out. My boss doesn't like me. He doesn't give me opportunity, you know. And I said, well, why does your boss not like you? Because you're short, fat? Why, why does he not like you? I said, because you're lazy. If you work hard, he will love you. Which boss would not like a hard-working guy? Create your own opportunity. It's got nothing to do because he's short and he's fat, and I don't know why my sister married him. But the fact is, he's a lazy guy. That's why his boss doesn't like it. I can tell you always my boss likes I can tell you always my boss like it. Let me tell you one more story to inspire you a little bit, you know? Um, when I was 26 years old, I did the entire joint venture between General Motors and Toyota, which was the largest joint venture in the history of automotive, where Toyota and General Motors agreed to build a car. They built a plan to build a car, which was plan was Prima, called Numi, right? So not only the job was complex to bring these Japanese and American company together that hated each other, right? Because each thought they were better than the other. But I had to go build a plan to build a car, then go build a plan to build seat, transmission, brakes, dashboard, steering wheel, every component of the car, right? So I had to do that. So there was a time that uh, 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 we were launching our first vehicle. And I was going plan to plan, make sure everything's happening on time, all the seats are in shit, tires are in shit, transmission is in shit. Because when car moves in assembly line, they gotta come right on time to go in. If car is moving, transmission is not there, the car cannot go. If the car cannot go, none of the car behind it can go. Major problem. And automotive means go kill yourself. You're dead. <laughs> That's why so many Japanese usually hang themselves. So, <laughs> so we had a bunch of Japanese watching the GM guys doing the seats. And one of the gals, she was really nervous. She got 20 Japanese guys behind her, constantly saying, what are you doing? and this girl is really nervous. And she's working on a very important machine called dielectric. Dielectric is where they, on a certain part of your seat, we got to put the reinforcement because you rub it. When you get in, you get out. So the fabric doesn't rip. We put the reinforcement in, and we melt that reinforcement in. So there's two, 3,000 watts of electricity going to that melt it instantly, stick the fabric to it, so you can ship it to the next part. And these people operating on an insulated environment. As this gal is doing her thing and as a shoki, she's turning around looking at a Japanese guy. I was afraid she might put her feet on the concrete and get, get electrocuted. So I said to her, Connie, would you pull aside and let me do this a little bit. Go get yourself a glass of water, relax a little bit. So as I'm doing it, and Japanese talking to me, and I'm talking to Japanese, I get my feet off the ground, put it in the concrete, and I got grabbed by this machine, and this machine shaking me up in the air, slamming me left and right like a piece of feather, right? 3,000 watts of electricity going to my body, right? So, so anyway, one of these guys just 
kicks me, so machine let go because even if you let the machine turn off, which is way back there, you have auxiliary unit power that powers that up. So anyway, I get in, my skin is all stuck to dielectric naturally because it touched my hand, right? I mean, you can see my flash in my skin, you know, significant burn, you know, smells everything. And, and I'm the one who's getting up, talk about intensity. I'm the one who's getting up to the guys who laugh because the Japanese are freaking out. They were going to turn emergency lights on. You don't want in the plan the red line emergency. They scared the shit out of everybody, right? <laughs> and everybody said, who was the cause of the light turn on, right? So I said, everybody in life, my flash is coming down. Some girls and guys throwing out, girls is pain. <laughs> you know, and, and I don't feel the pain because it just happened to me, right? So I was able to control the environment. And the guy was coming, you need to go to the relax. Then you just take care of this. I'll walk with you and go to the hospital together. So I took care of everything, make it like it's no big deal, you know, and let somebody else come through the ward. I walked out, they took me to the hospital. They did all the band-aid. They, they wanted to sleep in the hospital. I didn't. They said I had to come back for skin uh, graft, which later on I did. They packed my hands. I came back to the, to the uh, plant because I had, those seats had to be shed. The car had to be shed. So I started working while my hands are in the band-aid. And some blood seeped through, and it got into the color of the seat. So when the component went to Japan, naturally, these Japanese inspected everything. They inspect they said, what is this blood? So one of the Japanese said, this crazy guy, <laughs> this is a story, right? So every major prototype for every car is named after the plant. And that knew me, Freeman, my wife, my kids don't know that. And you, it was called Takaoka Pilot, because it was a Takaoka plant that put the whole thing together. So they named it after me to this day. Anything comes out of that plant, they call it Yona Pilot. So, so it's something that means, means nothing probably to, 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 to me because I'm done. I don't see that. But I hear that from time to time from people. And I look back and I said, I'm glad I did what I did. It was worth it. As long as I wasn't dead, I'm fine. You know, so, fine. so it's very important. It's very important to create your own opportunity. I created my opportunity. Because right when that happened, guess what happened? Every car, everybody in the industry heard about it. I had job offer from every big company. And I said, what a blessing, man. What is another dialectic? I shut my head. I started getting job offer from people, right? So you're right. Opportunity is very important. Don't wait for someone else to give you opportunity. Create your own. Because if you're going to be waiting, you're going to be waiting for a long time. Okay? What did you learn out of this? I mean, I like the, you know, once you find what, what your desire is, find you know, what inspires you. Let me tell you something about that, and this is advice to my own kid. A lot of things comes to you, and you want to do them, right? You have a new idea for an app, you have a new idea for a product and everything. And, and I think you should pursue them, because you never know what will work or not. I think everything will work if you put the right effort and, 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 and work ethic behind it, right? But while you're doing that, don't forget the basic obligation you have. Like, what is your basic obligation right now? School. Exactly. Finish school. So no matter what you're going to be doing, no matter what you're going to be working on, you say, guys, I'm going to do this, but I get this basic obligation. I got to get these things done. Guys, if you don't get your bachelor's degree in four years, it's pretty bad. I mean, when we get the resume, that's the first thing we look at. And when people say, oh, I have to work, we say, yeah, bullshit. <laughs> yeah, 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 give, give it to me. The first thing we look at when we get a resume, we see, did he finish in four years or not? And if he didn't finish in four years, we're going to spend the next two hours talking why he didn't finish in four years. And if he says, well, my parents didn't give me money, I had to get a job, part-time job, full-time job, he just say, oh, come on, give me a break, right? So you got to finish your story for years. You know, two things stay with you forever. One is your last name, the other one is the degree. Now, God help you if you don't get a degree. Oh, in today's world, in today's world, I mean, you could be in New York, you could be Spain, you could be Germany, Munich, Austria, anywhere. Oh, what kind of degree do you have? Oh, I have, I, 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 I went for a bachelor's degree, but I kind of did. Whoa, whoa, you didn't finish a bachelor's degree? Whoa, I kind of have a social degree. What, what is that? Right? You gotta finish that bachelor's degree. That is really important. That is a name clicker. You know, you know, you heard about in the same token. 
when we were running the company, a person graduated from Harvard or Yale, he never interviewed him. And I said, well, why don't you interview that kid? Well, Mr. Yonan, he graduated from Harvard. It's a kind of embarrassing to interview him. It's insult. To this day, that was true. You graduate from certain university, open the ticket, anything you want to do. You're set for the rest of your life. Had I go back, I would have gone to Harvard, get my bachelor and MBA. Stays with you forever. So focus on the very thing. Finish your school. You gotta finish that. You gotta finish that. No matter what. Be like General with an arrow in his eye and arrow in his leg. And he says, man, I'm bleeding, I'm tired, I'm hungry, but I gotta finish this thing. I gotta finish this thing. It, it goes by fast. It goes by fast. You will finish it soon. And then after that, it's up to you if you wanna get that advanced degree or not. Is advanced degree MBA important? I cannot tell you how important it is. I cannot tell you how important it is. Because it's really important in today's getting that MBA. It's very powerful, powerful, powerful degree. Really powerful. You know, here's do the math. The average bachelor graduates today, average bachelor graduates, let's do the math together. Average bachelor graduates today, graduating from bachelor gets average $50,000. Average MBA graduates graduating today is $85,000. That's $35,000 more. Now, assume you don't get your MBA, you stay with your bachelor. And assume you work in some place, you're getting a normal raise. What's the normal raise these days? 84%? Yeah. How many years is it going to be before you're at 85? 20 some years, right? Here's a math. So, of course, it's worth the MBA. Right? Simple math, right? Right? What did you learn? Except you're going to marry a fine guy. <laughs> <laughs> Leverage. That's very good. Leverage is very important. Learn how to use leverage. If you use leverage and arbitrage, you could make a lot of money and you can make, you can get to your goals faster. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you. I hope you got something out of this thing. Uh, it wasn't a drafted speech or anything. I wanted to be more inspirational, one-on-one, -on -one, give you some of my experience, and get you thinking something different that you normally do. And I hope, when you walk out of here, each one of you, each one of you, and I hope it's not playing less games, each one of you <laughs> think something differently that you really don't think. And that's gonna have this huge impact in your life. Thank you so much.